both ways up front. Um, one major objective we had uh, is when all things were equal in the recruiting process, if we had two or three kids that we really felt were good players that we considered to be of equal uh, stature on the football field is we wanted to find kids of intelligence. And we really scrutinized the transcripts and the test scores and wanted to find a group of kids that um, would represent this program in first class fashion in the academic side of things. Um, as of today, I had uh, Eric White go through and look at the transcripts, and of our 25 kids, 23 today, 20 or t two others that are already on campus, were just over a 3.0 in their uh, transcripts, which I thought was really good. And um, as always, we, we want to seek players of character, and um, our, our assistant coaches did a wonderful job with that. Uh, really, the last thing that we really, really wanted to push on was uh, having success in the Northeast always in New York, Northeast, uh, New England, and uh, New Jersey. And we wanted to make inroads in New Jersey, and we did that. We have five kids from New Jersey. One, uh, you know, was playing at a prep school, but his residence is in New Jersey. Uh, so I felt really good about that. And with all those things being said, I just want to take a quick second to thank our coaches and their families for uh, the sacrifices they made so we could go out there and uh, put together an extremely strong football class. With that, Coach, uh, what do you see from Marquise Blair, safety out of Ohio? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I really like Marquise. Um, he's um, he's long. Uh, he's got uh, great athleticism, um, and he's like a Darrell Eskridge body type. Maybe a little bit taller than Darrell was coming in, um, but he will strike you. I mean, he will strike you. I mean, he hits he hits like the safeties uh, we need around here. You know, so he's tall, long, but hits like Shamarco did, to be quite honest with you. That and the fact that um, he's just kind of a country kid, uh, that uh, he's from uh, Wooster, Ohio, and um, you know, that area up there is kind of spread out from where some of the football belt is, you know. Uh, it's kind of off the beaten track. We, uh, we found out about him and his coach, Doug Haas, brought him out here, and, and you know, when I watched the videotape, I fell in love with him, and I was expecting to see a five foot 11 kid because of the way he moved. Um, and then when he walked through the door, I was really pleased. And we were standing there. We had a camp day going on. He was not attending the camp. He was just seeing the campus. And they're running 40-yard dashes. Come across, coming 5-1, 4-9, 5-2. I said, you ever get timed in the 40? Yeah. And he didn't say anything. Now, bud, if you ran a 4-4-something four, a four, four 40, wouldn't you be excited to tell the college coach that? So then I said, what'd you run? He goes, well, I was at a camp and I ran a 4.45 and a 4.47, but my coach said I had the wrong shoes on. I said, what kind of shoes did you have on? He said, I had high top basketball shoes on. <laughs> so this guy, I'm excited about this guy. He's got a wonderful family, wonderful mother, um, and just excited to have him in the program. He's a very good football player. And you know, I love uh, recruiting secondary players and he's a guy I just fell in love with the, the instant I watched him. Once again, offense, defense, kicking game. Uh, he's a threefer. He, he plays on all sides, and uh, he's a good player. Nico. Good to see you, Coach. Hey, Nico. Hey, guys, a couple questions. Just you sure can. Back. So I'll start with Dante Strickland, the guy out of New Jersey. Just, uh, you, you know, what comes to mind when you see him, what kind of runner he is, and comparisons to any guys out there? Sure. Dante, he's got all the sk uh, skill sets. Um, it's kind of interesting. He's on the field almost every play of every game. Is amazing, you know. If you watched uh, his his offensive clips, obviously you were excited because, you know, he can take it to the distance at any time. He can catch the ball to the backfield. He's also an excellent return man. And on defense, he was he was very good too. Uh, another kid that, that I consider to be a striker, um, but uh, really he he brings the whole package to it, you know, with with where we want to go. Um, and uh, you know, I just don't think you go wrong. And the fact that he's from New Jersey it makes it even better. Patrick, so his Twitter handle says beast mode. Do you see any beast mode in Jordan? Oh, I, yeah, he's got some beast mode, I guess. He, uh, he's another great kid. Gatorade Player of the Year in the state of New York. Um, great, you know, great little football player. Compact runner. Um, he can get in and out of his breaks. He's got good vision. Of all the three tailbacks, uh, Tyrone Perkins as well, um, the thing I liked about all three of them is they all had offense and defensive clips. Too bad for Tyrone that he had an ACL early in the season. And we actually talked about maybe deferring his enrollment to give him time to continue to get healthy. 
um, but he's way ahead of schedule and the doctors compared notes and they said, you know, he, he's going to be ready. Um, so we, we jumped all over him as well, but all three of those kids have similar traits in that they play with great, great vision and they play all over the place on the field. Scott, Bruce Feldman from Fox quoted a coach as saying, it's, quote, never been nastier out there. Yeah. Recruiting. Yeah. And just today I saw Eric White tweet, you know, positivity over negativity. So, yeah. one, do you agree with that coach? Oh, totally. I think it's uh, extremely disrespectful, uh, disrespectful to the kids, the kids that are getting recruited when uh, you start throwing dirt bombs at each other. We won't do that. We won't do that. Uh, we'll try to stay above the bar on those things. Um, we had instances of that here at the end where people were throwing dirt at us and uh, felt horrible for the kids, just horrible. You know, these kids are still figuring out their way. And uh, when they make a decision, they're committed, they feel good about it. It's okay for a coach to call and say, are you sure? Are you firm on your commitment to whatever school? And when a kid says, yes, let's let it go. Let's end, you know, like Coach Harbaugh did. You know, Jim goes to Michigan. Jim's a very dear friend of mine who I respect. And uh, he was jumping all over Jake Pickard, you know, to see, to see if Jake would jump. Jake said, yeah, I'll take a visit. Took a visit. I'm sure he fell in love with Jim, just like everybody else does, you know what I mean? But when Jake came back home and decided he was going to stay with the Qs, Jim wrote him a very nice uh, a text saying, good luck, best of luck with Coach Shafe. That's the way it should be done. The others I won't mention, but it's just a, it's a doggone shame. It really is. Well, you focus on the positives and you understand, you know, uh, people out there in, in, in the world that we live in today are always going to throw dirt and are more interested in trying to get the story that has some sense of controversy to it or whatever. And we focus on let's find good kids of high character uh, that deserve to be at Syracuse and uh, let's let's handle our business the right way. You know, show the way, model the way. You know, that's the way you want to do it. Win, lose or draw. You want to be able to walk on and off, in and out of this building, on and off the football field with integrity. And we try to recruit kids of integrity and uh, try to get people involved that uh, have their best interest. You know, and I think it's a responsibility of the college coaches to do so, but also the high school coaches. You know, when a kid makes his decision and says, Coach, I want to go to Syracuse, I think that high school coach has to respect that as well and protect them. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have that. Most of the times we did in this situation uh, with this class. Uh, but there are a couple instances where people come in and out of the door. And um, that's reality of the, of the real, you know, the real deal recruiting right now. And it is ugly right now out there. And it's a damn shame. Steven. Uh, while we're on the kind of topic of ethics in, in recruiting, uh, a couple of guys who were committed to the class and decommitted said that um, assistant coaches weren't responding to them for periods of time this year, West Lindor and Joe. Yeah, Robinson. here's what I'd like to say to that, Stephen, since you're going to go straight to the decommitted kids. Well, yeah, I was doing that until you just interrupted me. Um, I want to talk about the kids that have committed to Syracuse. You know, once again, when you guys jump on the phone and on the text with these kids and you're asking the kids questions, you're going to get the kids' side of the story. Our side of the story will be we're going to try to recruit the kids at best fit and reach the standards that, and expectations that we put out there for them. And if those standards fall short, when bars are set, when kids are committed early to you and you say A, B, and C need to be met by fall semester, and when A, B, and C aren't met, we have to move in another direction. Those are how some of those stories go. Can you give me an example? That was the example I'll give you. No, there is no other example. We're going to talk about the committed players at Syracuse. If you guys want to try to bring those stories in, go ahead. I don't understand that focus. It's supposed to be a great day for 18-year-old kids that are going to Syracuse and coaches that busted their tails and wives and children that gave up uh, a lot of time with their, their people. We make decisions that are in the best interest of the team, not the individual that doesn't make the cut. It's as simple as that. With respect towards the kid, too, by the way. You know, I, I know this is a little bit off the beaten path too, but we haven't had a chance to talk to you in months. Um, you guys were convinced Alan was going to be here. Can you tell us what, what kind of broke down? He there? came up short academically. God bless him. He's at Garden City Community College, and, and, and we're looking forward to him having success there, both on and off the field, especially in the uh, classroom, and um, wish him all the best and hope he can make it. 
when did that kind of take place? I know it was here. It was a process that went on, you know, throughout the course of time. He just come up, uh, kept coming up a little bit short, but God love him, and he's going to do a good job there. And, and like I said, you know, he's a great kid, great parents, uh, you know, and I just wish the best to him. And, and we'll see, you know, see how things work out, you know, these next two years at, uh, you know, the junior college, and then we'll be able to take, take a look at seeing if he can come back. So some mutual interest for two years down the line. Oh, yeah, I love that kid. Coach, uh, Chandler obviously got a ring on Sunday. Sure did. A couple of years ago, them and kind of all the guys in this room, yeah. weren't those four and five stars, you know, on a day like this. Yeah. Can you kind of talk about y'all's philosophy and what it enables you to take those kids about the time? Sure. It's a great question. I, I know, like Bud and I talked about it a couple of years when we first got into the, uh, uh, the recruiting deal and, and kind of the philosophy behind it. Really, my philosophy is, is uh, hire good coaches that are good evaluators of talent. Watch the film without regard for who thought they were good players, uh, who offered them, who put stars next to their names or ratings, and believe our own eyes. Um, you know, we've been in this business, I've been in it 24 years. We have to trust ourselves and one another. And uh, that's always been the approach. And I used to always joke with the guys, you know, when I was the defensive coordinator, I'd say, okay, let's take a look at these 23 defensive kids today. I don't want to know anything about them other than what are they, what's their size, weight, and their academic, you know, profile. Uh, I don't want to know uh, Nebraska's on them, you know, nothing like that. We just turn on a tape and make our decisions uh, that way. And it's funny, you mentioned Chandler and Arthur. You know, Chandler, we used to put his tape on when we were comparing other defensive ends. I'd say, let's go back and look at Chandler's stuff. Or let's go back and look at, you know, a former player that played the same position and believe our own eyes, really. And it's, it's ironic because a lot of our kids had ended up picking up more traffic than any in this class. For instance, uh, Stephen Clark. You know, Stephen, he's in the middle, in the middle of Alabama, just middle of nowhere, to be honest with you. A little town, neat little town right there. Just good folks, really neat people. Uh, when Coach Dowse brought him to the table and we all really liked him, you know, there weren't a lot of people on him. And then after we were on him, people started to follow his trail a little bit more. And in those last two weeks, we had folks like Florida and Ole Miss and, and others, Vanderbilt, came in, uh, you know, trying to pluck him out. Um, and that's where I think the credit goes to the coaches because we want to try to identify the, the talent level or the talented kids that we think meet this criteria early and then recruit them and build relationships with them and the people most important in their lives for as long as possible, as long as possible, because I think there's staying power with the right ones if you've recruited them early and really get to know who they are. And uh, there are great examples. Pickard's one example. He committed to Wisconsin. You know, I think it was the day he committed to Wisconsin. I was like, hey, Jay, congratulations. Go get them. If anything changes down the road, give me a shout. And then when Coach left and went to Oregon State, we get a phone call. And then he comes back out. It was the third time he had been here. He, you know, he knew everybody by name. So did his parents. So did his brothers. You know, little Luke was, he was fired up. You know, his brother might have a chance to be a little bit closer to home. And I think that staying power uh, through relationships is what uh, brought us to uh, keeping those kids committed. Sure. Um, yeah, you know, the defensive line in a lot of ways is the most difficult position to recruit because we all, we're all looking for them. And I think, you know, when we went through the whole process, we said we got to have a list of 15 to get, you know, to the number we wanted to. Uh, Stephen Clark, um, he, he played both sides of the ball, got a chance to watch him play basketball, saw how well he moved. He's bright, a very good student, um, and was physical, you know, so we fell in love with him. Um, when you go through uh, Pickard, Long, he is similar to Chandler, and not to set that bar, but um, the thing I loved about Jake Pickard is I love his motor. If you watch his tape, you know, there are times I was joking with his dad, there are times where his technique is just absolutely horrendous, but his effort overcomes it. You can coach technique with a kid that has talent and has long arms like he does, but that effort, that high motor is something you can't. Amir Ely, same thing, had a chance to watch him play basketball, multi-sport guy. He can turn on a dime. Kadir Shepard, both he and uh, Ely can play uh, defensive end. And if you watch their tape, you see their athleticism catching the football down the field. 
Tyler Cross is probably the one kid that was, was more old school, three technique, nose guard guy that you got to watch a ton of reps. And, and he's a very talented kid. He's very explosive and he moves extremely well on the turn. You know, he can bend, as Coach Dows likes to call it. He can bend really in a step and step and a half, which is hard to teach. So I think when I look at those defensive linemen, um, I see kids with, uh, you know, high motor, high intelligence, and, and a love for the game. How did the change of offensive coordinator midseason impact how you went after players on the offensive side of the ball? Well, what I, want, what I try to do is just go back and evaluate how we felt about all the kids that we already had committed and signed and see if there were any change agents there. And there really weren't too much. We were really excited about this whole offensive line way back when we first really started to get those early commits out of them. Um, and I don't, uh, the impact probably wasn't, uh, wasn't huge. Um, we did want to find a, a mid-year tight end. If we could find one out there, that was probably the biggest thing we did with getting Trey Dunkelberger to come in here. And I was really excited uh, to see that he was from Pennsylvania because, you know, he was out in California, JC. And then when I saw Pennsylvania, that, that fired me up even more. Um, so probably trying to get uh, an immediate guy in there to kind of give us another tight end at the mid-year was a big push to see if we could get that done. But other than that, we felt really good about the kids committed. We liked those three running backs uh, way back when. And uh, that was the good thing about the process is, you know, um, we do it all together as, sta as a staff, offense, defense, bring them all together and make those decisions. So it's not, you know, one guy making a decision at the top. Whereas other schools, really, a coordinator may make 90% 90, 90 of the decisions. Uh, we're all going to vote on it. We'll literally put our hands up, rank them. Who do you think? Getting little fights over it and stuff. So not a whole lot of change agent there. He's done a great job. Bobby Acosta has been a big asset um, along with the coaches and the position coaches because, you know, Bobby's he's from there. He understands it. Um, he can talk to the New Jersey coaches. He's done a great job there. Even though he was at a smaller school, the respect factor for Bobby Acosta in that state was huge. Before we hired him, that was one thing I had a chance to do is reach out to some of those guys and say, what's this guy like running through your you know, your schools and looking at your kids, and it was nothing but positives. He's high energy, he loves, you know, he loves the New Jersey kid, and it just fit perfectly. And then you back that up with our position coaches taking over and doing a good job, and um, just a great job by the staff. Yeah, but Bobby did a, an excellent job in New Jersey. Dan. Hey, Scott. Hey, Dan. How are you? Great. Not just the talent level, but obviously you and your staff, morals, values, everything that you don't see on the field that you really look at the integrity and the character of the guys that you bring in. Just speak on that and the classes that you brought in since you became head coach, including this Yeah, well, I yeah, appreciate the question. Um, we, have, you know, we have good kids. Anytime you have 105 to 120 kids on a team with all that testosterone running around, you know, I worry. There are nights I worry. You know, they got to dance up on campus or something like that. Some of you guys that went to school here, you know what I'm talking about. Any college you go to. Um, and we really have not had, um, we <laughs> haven't had any problems off the field, you know, after that first couple weeks on the job, to be quite honest with you. Um, you know, kids of character doesn't mean they're perfect. If, if you had my mom here in a corner, she could tell you some stories. <laughs> she really could. Um, but, you know, I look for solid kids that, one, love football, two, value education, and then three, have some, some sort of a support system back home. Doesn't always have to be mom and dad, you know, usually it isn't. Uh, but is there a mother? Is there a grandmother? Is there a solid coach that has a reputation that we can lean on that, that vouches for this young man? Um, is it a guy like Dennis, uh, Dennis McCarthy that's, that's been in New Jersey rating kids, you know, for 30 some years? who says, boy, Kenny Carter's a special kid. You know, I got, a, I got an email from him um, talking about Kenny Carter and, and his life story and how he's worked through different things. Because uh, I loved him on tape when he was a junior. Um, but, you know, it was kind of hard to get a hold of him. The phone and, and that sort of thing wasn't always on. And, and uh, when I met his high school coach and felt his value systems, it was really a slam dunk once we got him on campus. So it takes every kind of kid from every kind of background uh, to put together a good football team. 
And uh, it does start with those types of things. It doesn't mean we're not going to make a mistake every now and again, too. And then you fess up to it and you move forward. But uh, I've been really pleased with the kids that have been in the program. And uh, I really think this class is just going to continue to add to what type of kid we have in our program here at Syracuse. So how do I wow you if I'm a long snapper? <laughs> what, what are you looking for? It's kind of like the quarterback. We like to see all of our quarterbacks throw live. And we like to see our long snappers snap live, and and uh, it's, 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 it's 14 yards, 15 yeah. yards. It's hard. You ever try it? No, but you know. well, until you try it. <laughs> Come on, that's a fifty thousand dollar year kid, right? Long snapper. Yeah, it might even be more than that now, right? Yeah. yeah Sam Rogers. You never heard about him much because he always put the ball where it was supposed to be. I could only think of one that he that he kind of threw on the ground a little bit. Um, they're invaluable. You know, that's why the NFL pays a lot of money for them, too. And you don't hear much about them, do you? It's a really important uh, deal. And, and, you know, losing Sammy was a tough deal, you know, because he was just quietly going about his business and quietly going about his business off the field, too. He's a special guy. And, uh, you know, for me, and again, there, if, you go through the, if you go through the whole list, you're not going to see a big list about all the great snaps that Matt Keller had. You know, he, he was 90% at the right thigh board. You know, you're not going to see that stuff. It's not statistics that you, you march in and, and you brag about. I can tell you this, he's an excellent student. He's already enrolled here. And we actually had a conversation this morning at about 6.15 a.m. because we had a morning workout. And I said, you know, right now you'd be getting out of bed. You'd be heading over to uh, homeroom. I said, uh, do you feel like you made the right decision? He's like, yes, coach. And at the time, he was doing up-downs and chopping his knees. Um, it, it's a really important position, bud, and it's, it's just about that quiet uh, consistency. And uh, we're excited to let him come in here and, and compete against the other kids. We have time for a question or two more, Steven. Uh, Two-part question on Jake Moreland and how he relates to recruiting. I know he came in really late in the class. Right. What was he kind of able to do? I know Keelan Whitner had a... Uh, uh, an Air Force offer, is he relevant to that at all? And also moving forward, um, do you know where he's going to fit in recruiting-wise as far as geographically? Yeah, first first part of the question, um, he, you know, he really did not have a big role in the recruiting, including uh, Kylan, um, other than uh, having some meals with him once we were allowed to let him have meals, right, or least. <laughs> once he got signed, signed, sealed, and delivered, Coach Moreland was in there. Um, you know, down the road, he's been in different, different pockets. We're actually going to sit down and and rewrite where we're going to put people and that sort of thing. But no, no decisions have been made. I just literally 12 minutes before I came in here, I was with Eric, and we were talking about some of those things. So we'll make those decisions moving forward. But uh, he's a strong recruiter. You know, he's been in Atlanta. He's been in Alabama, been in Chicago, been in Wisconsin. Um, so we have a lot of our uh, variety there. And he's got a wonderful wife, Anne, and three beautiful daughters. It'll add to our ability to uh, – uh, lure more talent in here uh, with kids running around. <laughs> Chris? Yeah, you, you mentioned the Northeast. One of the other areas you've always stressed with us is, is South Florida and how yeah. much it's meant to you. Um, is that still an emphasis uh, for you and it's important? I think to some degree it is. You know, um, I think where you have talented guys that have had success recruiting is probably a, a good place to start. Um, you know, last year we're sitting around, you know, last few years, right, really five years uh, prior, we're talking, why can't we get New Jersey guys? You had a talented coach like Bobby who knows the area and can scout it out well. And now we pluck, you know, five, you know, five kids out of there. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's as much the person as well as the place. It's got to be a combination when you make your decisions. You don't want to force an area. You know, there's different areas where people have had success. And, uh, you know, you got to stay with what has worked. And, and that's what we'll do with, you know, with our guys' abilities where they've had success in the past. But, you know, I do like the South Florida kid. I've recruited down there myself for a long time. Um, there'll be some change agent there. Um, but we'll work through it and still have it as a place that we recruit, that's for sure. Do you feel like um, the way things went with George hurts you there at all in the future? No, I don't. I really don't. No, South Florida kids go to play where they see the depth chart and they say they can get on the field the, the quickest. And they have, and those kids always seem to do a good job when they go far from home. I don't know why, you know. So, and I've seen, I've had a lot of coaches I've worked with have done a nice job recruiting that area, including including George. So, 
you know, it's just a matter of us uh, picking up the pieces to get the ni next guy down there and, and going with it. Do you have any guys with the tie? Ties there other than yourself? Well, all of us have recruited down there at some point in time. Technically, I think every coach in the country can say he's recruited South, <laughs> South Florida at one point, point or time. <laughs> Last question, Zach. Coach, you're primarily going to be judged on wins and losses. So how much of a temptation is there to kind of sl slip a talented kid through who's a little short academically? Well, it just, I think it's um, whether, you know, no matter where I've been, whether we're, you know, whether we were having a ton of success or had a tough season, um, you play the best players that give yourself a chance. You recruit the ones, but we'll, we'll never lower the bar where we're striking out too much. You know, we're, you know, I think in this class, you know, we still have two or three guys that'll be, you know, working hard to make sure they're qualified. Um, I think anytime you get past that number, then you're, you're in a, uh, you know, in a situation where you're vulnerable to letting your teammates down and your coaches down. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you very much, Coach. Okay. Thank you.